Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of the Poisons and Pestilence podcast, episode 23, Tear Gas Tasting Notes with Dan Casita. When lesser means have failed, chemical munitions in sufficient quantity can safely enforce meekness on the violent and establish the control which will permit routine police action. Tear gas properly used is an invisible, dependable, and effective weapon for law and order. Dan, it's wonderful to have you back on the show. Um, What's brought you on today? Well, let's talk about tear gas and riot control agents, which are kind of the same thing, I guess. Uh, And it's uh, it's a subject that, forgive the pun, has been burning me for some some time. Uh, And that's something I really kind of want to talk about, because I, first of all, I'm probably the only guy that's writing tasting notes on tear gas uh, as Appendix B of an upcoming book of mine. But uh, I've got a lot of experience on this, but also it's, I think it's relevant to this sort of, you know, history and policy and stuff that, you know, you do, I do, and all that, and it rears its ugly head sometimes. I think tear gas is really important in a lot of ways. First of all, it's historically important. It's, it's historically important in that it's where the story of battlefield chemical warfare begins. Okay, If you go back to the First World War, chemical warfare didn't start with chlorine and EEP. It really started before that with tear gas compound. But also, tear gas sits in this odd category in between sort of the so-called more serious chemical warfare agents, things that we would consider sort of non-chemical policing methods, whether it be guns or large sticks or water cannon. So tear gas exists in a policing and security realm as well as in a military uh, and is regulated somewhat differently uh, in, in that realm. But also tear gas does pop up. Uh, you know, it's rarely a month that goes by without some some outrage, whether it's a real outrage, you know, or a contrived outrage uh, involving involving tear gas. But I'd also say that I have a lot of personal, you know, history with tear gas early in my career. I reckon I've been exposed to CS, the most common tear gas, probably 250 times. Um, so much so that I, I did develop a bit of immunity to it. I've been exposed to CN, an older one, a few times. Pepper spray once, never again. The other chemicals out there that were at various points used as, as tear gas are largely of historical interest. So my own my own narrative started somewhere around 1988, uh, U.S. Army Reserve, you know, taking my gas mask off and, you know, getting a lungful of this awful stuff, awful stuff called CS. And there I am today here, you know, uh, I've taken my little, I've taken my writing operation on the road to North Wales, and here I am talking to you in Bath about tear gas, and it's 2024. So, where do you want to start with this whole story? Well, I'd be interested, as the I'm the person with a nerdy interest in in the history. Who do we have to blame for tear gas? Where does it uh, emerge from? You know, it's commonplace to try to blame things on either the French or the Germans in this country. Uh, this is one we can actually lay on the French. Okay, we can lay blame for tear gas on the French, but I'm gonna also I'm gonna also submit a mitigating case to to sort of soften the blow on the French. All right, the very first widely used tear gas with this stuff. I, you know, I'm gonna I'm going I'm going to really really uh, apologize to the listeners because there are gonna be some chemical names here, and I, you know we will end up probably using some acronyms for them. The very first one was this stuff called ethyl bromoacetate or EBA. Now, it's an industrial chemical that was first synthesized in the 1850s. I can't quite put my finger on exactly when it was first used by the by the Paris police. Uh, we're talking possibly as early as sort of 1905 to 1908, definitely by 1910. This chemical, ethyl bromoacetate, which is a sort of colorless, maybe slightly yellowish liquid, was being used basically in sort of shotgun projectiles it to uh, basically subdue people because of its extremely irritating nature. Now, the French had field this as, uh, and this is a theme that will come up again and again and again in the history of tear gas, as a a non-violent, uh, you know, sort of intermediate force measure. 
you know, the idea that, well, we got to have something that we can subdue rioters with, or uh, the bank robbers have holed themselves up in a house and are holding hostages or things like that. Your three classic law enforcement use cases for, for tear gas are large band of rioters. We want them to disperse and go home and stop riot. You make their environment unpleasant, and tear gas is a way of doing that. You got your siege and barricade situations. This is like your classic sort of 1970s U.S. police shows. You know, I think there's a good Kojak episode on this where, you know, the, 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 the bank robbers or kidnappers or terrorists or whoever they are, they're, they, they've been caught and cornered. They're holed up, uh, they're holed up in, in some Hollywood stage set that looks like a corner block of New York City. So they lob a bunch of tear gas and the guys come out all screaming, uh, screaming and then they get easily arrested. Or... A little bit more recently than that, to give a policeman something on his person that is uh, less lethal than a the, the, than a gun or a stick. Actually, you know, a good bruiser of a police officer can really kill you with a stick or permanently maim somebody. This leads, to, particularly in democratic and litigious societies, this leads to disability claims. Whereas a good spray in the face of some sort of irritant chemical, whether it's a traditional tear gas or your more modern pepper spray, does give the police a non-lethal, mostly non-lethal, uh, genuinely, genuinely non-lethal option. But what happens in 1914? The French army goes to war, but the French declare a national mobilization. All right. Rather, a lot of these French policemen are reservists. So they get called up, they go to the front, and a lot of these guys take their gas guns. A gas gun was basically a short-barreled shotgun wider bore than a normal shotgun, chambered only to uh, to shoot a, a, a special projectile. They took their gas guns with them to the trenches. I mean, frankly, if I was a cop in Paris in 1914, I got called up, you know, I'm like, yeah, what? this is new and cool. I'm taking this with me. Um, and so, although the French army had dabbled in munitions involving this EBA as early as 1912, as best I can tell, there wasn't a top-down directed order to for these guys to use this stuff it was ad hoc probably concentrated because it's not like these guys are scattered around these paris cops called up were probably in only a handful of regiments uh because this stuff was done very territorially in the, in the french national mobilization so you know you had ad hoc uses almost as quickly as the war happened and this provoked escalation by the germans okay and so you've got a little bit of tit for tat using irritant chemicals. The first major chemical attack is not the chlorine attack at Eep. It was in a place in uh, in Poland earlier that year, early January 1915, where the Germans used a chemical called xylobromide. Uh, now xylobromide, you know, basically has a little bit of a track record as a tear gas, and xylobromide was used in this this attack. Very poorly because it was really cold. It was Poland. It was you know, January 1915. So this original attack, which was the first, you know, German major chemical warfare attack executed by Fritz Haber, who you know, the German chemist. Uh, so what you get is, you know, it didn't work. So what you see from 1915 onward is that tear gas does have quite a a running running sort of use in the war, but it it loses the the spotlight, I guess, because more lethal chemicals like chlorine and then phosgene and things like, you know, uh, so-called mustard gas, sulfur mustard, uh, are used. But a variety, a variety of chemical compounds that really in and of themselves are like things like benzyl bromide, bromoacetone, iodoacetone, uh, these things, these things are extremely irritating. And part of the entire, you know, point of chemical warfare in the First World War was try to get guys out of trenches. The most lethal gas, uh, you know, yeah, I say gas because it really was a gas. Most of these things are, weren't gases. It was phosgene, but phosgene has very delayed action. Okay, you get sick from phosgene six, ten, twelve hours later. Uh, it's not that good at like clearing a trench out, whereas some of these things are. So a lot of these things were also used in, in weird cocktails. There are a variety of cocktails. The first generation of tear gases, which were all basically liquids, they were all industrial compounds, and they were all irritants kind of get some of them cause temporary blindness some of these photographs where you see where the various you know british soldiers all daisy chained with bandages on their eyes and you know uh hands on the shoulders in front of them rather a lot of those 
you know, are purported to be mustard gas victims, but in reality, we're, we're tear gas victims because the, some of these tear gases cause immediate painful but temporary blindness, whereas the eye injuries from uh, from mustard are tend to be much longer to uh, develop. So the guys aren't in the trenches when it happens. They've been evacuated to the rear. So, you know, so even that gas, that iconic painting, that, you know, I'm going to make these sort of like, you know, I guess literally iconoclastic observation. I think that was probably based on tear gas, not mustard. I mean, one thing that really struck me is I went, when I was out in Belgium a few yeah. years ago, I went to a destruction facility yeah. and they had all of these shells. They had like a national, they called it a national library, which is where basically the farmers brought the stuff they got. I, I would love to go see that, by the way, if you got a contact there. I, I need to go see I'll, We'll see what we can do. Maybe they're listening. And in that establishment, what, what struck me was the fact that when we look, hear the history of the First World War, we always assumed like it was a mass production war like industrial scale. So we assume that, so a lot of the emphasis is on this idea of standardization of munitions and those sorts of things. Yeah, it's a real mess. I mean, it's a real mess. And that wasn't just, that was all the distinctives of the regions it was being made, where it was coming from. So it didn't, it distinguished significantly between, within armies over periods of years, and not just in terms of natural evolution, but also just, it was always a bit scattergun. And I think shortly after that um, trip, I was reading somewhere, I think it was on the French program, and they were saying that at one point, the French, uh, well, the French military organizations basically put a letter out to mm. tell scientists to stop sending them samples, to stop sending yeah. them ideas for chemical munitions. Yeah. Like they, there was so much, and it's this idea that this was a a, a a crucible rather than this kind of they these these weapons weren't sat there in reserve at the outbreak of the first there, world there, war. There, there were a lot of there was a lot of uh, sort of have a go uh, have a go Henry stuff here. Uh, you know, there, if you look yep. at the actual list of chemicals that were used in the First World War, it's a quite lengthy list. Uh, and most of them are things that we haven't heard of. They've been consigned yep. to the dustbin in history. Nobody has since used xylobromide really as either a tear gas or a chemical weapon because it's kind of pointless. And again, this gets to another thing, and we can we we can have many podcasts on the subject of the actual legacy of chemical warfare from the First World War is mostly of disappointment, not of great success. And one of the reasons why chemical warfare was generally agreed to be banned was it was kind of pointless and a waste of money. So it was therefore easy to give up. Uh, the other categories of warfare, airplanes, tanks, submarines, machine guns, landmines, barbed wire, even zeppelins all showed you know prospect. You look at the actual track record, the chemical weapons and what they had cost and the effort and everything. And, uh, you can see the bean counters in 1919 and 1920 saying, you know what, this... This falls below a line on the spreadsheet. Now, submarines, that's where you want to put your butt. Yeah, I said there was a whole episode on this. But I mean, if you read stuff from the kind of chemical war service type organizations of the 1920s, a lot of their yeah, arguments are basically, yeah, yeah. there is potential. Like, we've, we've, we've got explo- explosives are as deadly as they're ever going to be. And it's it, the, the potential sits in chemistry and all yeah, these yes. types of unlike of say ideas. yeah unlike say you know lethal phosgene and mustard there really isn't a civil market for it but there is a civil market for tear gas and what you get is you get this funny rather incestuous relationship between former U.S. Army chemical and actually still serving U.S. Army chemical warfare service guys in private industry to field this new compound called CN okay. Oh, which was later trademarked as Mace, actually. Uh, oh, I should say that the trademark for Mace now means other things, but a CN, which is actually chloroacetophenone, it's got several even longer names. We'll just leave it. We're just going to call it CN. Was the established de facto yep. tear gas from the 1920s onward? It works as both a liquid and a smoke. Lends itself to. Um, you know, burning cylinder type grenades, the classic tear gas grenade is basic design hasn't changed to the present day. Uh, you take this CN, which is a solid at room temperature, and you mix it with some sort of burning filler and you ignite the whole thing and it makes a cloud and smoke. That smoke cloud, some of that smoke is CN particles. And CN rather perniciously has got a, a kind of fruity smell. So your first whiff of it, you're like, Oh, that doesn't smell too bad. And then it sort of hits you. As C- as CN um, was the establishment tear gas. It, and uh, back to what I said uh, about this incestuous relationship between the U.S. Army and private industry. There was 
several companies actively selling this both into the police and civil, uh, civilian personal defense market. You know, there, there, there's this amazing book by this guy named Swearingen who basically catalogs all this stuff. He was a Marine Corps warrant officer, U.S. Marine Corps warrant officer at some point in about the 1960s. And his, his book is this effectively this catalog where he systematically tries to catalog every single one of these devices. There were ballpoint pens. There were gas pistols. There were spray devices. There were a huge number of different types of shotgun shells. And because the U.S., Law enforcement market was and is very fractionated and uh, you know sort of balkanized. They employed people to sell this stuff you know, all over the U.S. to police departments. Again, in this, gee, what do you got to do? You can't shoot them all the time, and you don't want to necessarily get close enough to hit them with a stick, and he might hit you back. How about some tear gas? And so it became an industry. And I, like many things, I think there was this kind of hype around. Oh yeah, obviously when the industry was part of its civilian markets for the first time and i i think i was doing a uh, newspaper search in the uk and one thing that came up surprisingly often actually in the late 60s was people yeah. discovering safes that had a oh, yeah. hidden uh, tear gas canister within them and they're not realizing you get some seriously bad chemicals that were being used some of these chemical warfare agents from the first world war were used by the city of new york for uh rodent control down in the sewers that's it I, I have no idea if the rumor is true that a uh, lewisite was actually used down in the sewers, but that's a persistent rumor. It goes around sort of CBRN types in New York City. Uh, but you're right. And so, and so one one application of this is, you know, you know, you put tear gas canisters in, the, it, build them into the wall of the safe. So, the, so even if the safe crackers drill it out or pick it or crack it or, you know, they, they haven't done the right way, they're going to set off this irritating gas and they're going to get, yeah. Um, I, now, the drawback here is, okay, First of all, there, 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 there become safety issues with tear gas. Uh, the safety issues that were apparent with CN become apparent later on, too, and apply to later munitions. CN is largely retired, but you get a basic safety problem. First of all, uh, a projectile file fired out of a shotgun, even if it just lands somewhere and burns, it's still a projectile fired out of a shotgun. It's a solid object. If it hits you in the head, it could kill you. Okay. Now these are these are not designed to have the same sort of kinetic energy or muzzle velocity as actual, you know, shotgun slugs that were designed for deer hunting things like that. But you don't want to get hit with one of these things at all, and you especially don't want it close range. So there becomes both a training and an execution uh, issue with this. Some 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 cop using one of these things for the first time, you know, uh, decides to shoot somebody in the leg or the head with it. You know, you could really hurt somebody, and and so. You have fatalities. Now, you have this situation where this occasionally gets put down as a tear gas fatality. It's not a tear gas fatality. It's a blunt force trauma fatality. So when you see figures uh, talking about, you know, tear gas fatalities, you get, you've got to actually parse that a little bit more carefully to see, is it an actual fatality from, from actual toxicity or is it blunt force trauma? Or this other category, things catching on fire. Okay, because you know, if you if you get basically, if you can picture it, something the size of, I mean, your average tear gas grenade is about the size of a single beer can. It's usually metal, not always. You know, some of the more modern ones have got plastic stuff like that. And this burning filler, and the burning filler could be a lot of things. It's often just sugar. Okay, this burning filler burns at a high temperature. Some of these things have been, some of these things have been clocked as high as well over seven hundred degrees Celsius. Now that's that's on the high end, but routinely 200, 300, 400 degrees Celsius, they're hot enough to set other things on fire. And particularly in a society where it's in 1920, you know, there weren't a lot of plastics around. There was a lot of synthetic, you know, clothing. But that stuff is easily set on fire at quite low temperature. And plastics, you know, melt and turn into other nasty chemicals and stuff like this. So you could cause fires with tear gas. And I mean, I did some uh, reading around this a few years ago, and a lot of this was about as well. It wasn't the the agent themselves have concerns from a higher public health perspective, human rights perspective, but a lot of it was as fact was the delivery systems, and particularly because we'll get into this in a moment. You know, tear gas is not something that's supposed to be used on the battlefield. It's something that's not supposed to be developed for a military battlefield application. And yet, if you look at some of the technologies that have been developed as a means to deliver tear gas. 
there was seemed to be very few scenarios in which that could be delivered utilizing that technology in a way that wasn't going to hurt, really hurt people. So some of these kind of, you know, ones that are strapped to helicopters or involve a cluster munition. And, uh, yeah, in fact, let's fast forward a bit, okay? I'm going to say that largely we get to we, we get to this second world war. Tear gas, although it's mass produced by all the major combatants, mostly the CN, a few other compounds as well, mostly doesn't get used. The, again, the glaring exception is China. The Japanese use a lot of chemical warfare agents, including tear gas, but also more serious stuff. And uh, Japan used them against China. There was a little bit of retaliatory use when things were captured. And that was a bitter war. It is possible that more people died from chemical warfare on that front than died from chemical warfare on the Western Front in the First World War. It's just that it's not very well documented, and we don't talk about it. But that aside, tear gas doesn't really get much of a... I mean, tear gas does get a use in, but it's in things like the occasional prison camp riot or, you know, in actual sort of civil policing roles, okay? Now, also, tear gas is in a gray area legally. There's this 1920s protocol on, on, on chemical weapons. Uh, depending on how you read it, it's sort of the majority opinion would say, well, okay, this, this would apply to tear gas and warfare. Uh, it doesn't say anything about anything domestic use, okay? So it's only about, you know, wars between states' parties. The U.S. never really adopted the Geneva Protocol until quite late in the game anyway. So so some of this Second World War stuff is probably the major competence thinking this is probably part of the, the Geneva Protocol ban. And I think, you know, when we get towards the end of this discussion, we're going to talk about the later, you know, more explicit ban in the Chemical Weapons Convention. So... Fast forward through the Second World War. Uh, happy to revisit some other date if I get more data on, on it. And from the Second World War onward, we have this new compound, CS. A CS uh, becomes the standard tear gas. It operates in the same way. You can, you can dissolve it in liquid, make it a spray, or you can scatter powder of it or these burning munitions. But CS uh, is more effective in a lot of ways. It has a wider safety margin. Now, I'll explain what you mean by the, what I mean by that. First of all, it's more effective in that the the, the bottom end dose that is going to you know really irritate somebody is actually lower than than CN, so you don't need as much of it uh, to have an effect. It's more persistent in the environment, actually, uh, in a lot of ways. It, then there's a safety mar- mar- uh, margin issue. Technically, CN, you could probably poison somebody to death with CN. Now, I've done the cocktail napkin maths on this. You basically need a standard CN grenade. You need to basically and put somebody in a phone booth with it and make sure the phone booth is sealed up and there's no air change, and that will probably poison somebody with it. But yeah, but the point at which CS is a toxicity lethality hazard is something like yeah, five to ten times higher than CN. So it has a wider zone of safe use, okay? It is... Again, I, some of this is very much anecdotal, but it, it, it jives with my own experience. It's more quick. C, a CN might take a few seconds. CS is a slap in the face. I see, uh, the CN primarily, in my experience, is, is the eyes, the nose, the mouth, breathing, coughing. Where CS is, it stings your whole body. If you get, you know, you're exposed to a cloud of CS particles. It's like getting bit by ants all over. Okay. Uh, it's unpleasant. So it's it's considered more unpleasant, but safer to use. Okay. Now, again, those safety issues don't take into consideration the projectile and the burning issues. So CS becomes this default thing and becomes widely used all over the world. Okay. It is the iconic tear gas of race riots of 1950s, 1960s, civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, uh, and all that. But also... It becomes extremely heavily used in the Vietnam conflict, okay? And it, it's used in, uh, well, first of all, the U.S. takes the opinion that, A, we're not really signed up to this whole Geneva Protocol thing anyway, so that's a, you know, that's not really a thing here. Second, these are chemical substances that are available for civilian off-the-shelf off the, off the shelf purchase in the U.S., so we don't consider them illegal, you know, for us to use in Vietnam. Third, they, they are generally non-lethal, so, you know, you know, it's not like we're yeah, it's not like we're you're putting nerve agents down tunnel systems into the bunkers to clear things out. And of course, plus, and this came in the context of large scale herbicide use and those sorts of things. Oh yeah, 
Well, the same 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 argument with the herbicides. That herbicide you could yeah, that that Agent Orange herbicide you could go buy and use it yourself. So, uh, you know, it it was we can we can have a whole discussion at some other point about ranch hand and the herbicide thing and the uh, the massive own goal that turned out to be for the U.S. But yeah, so tear gas uh, gets a huge use. It's, there's a book by a guy named Hank Ellison who was a member of the U.S. Army Cabinet or a uh, useful book. And more importantly, he usefully categorizes and catalogs all the different, both official and improvised munitions that were developed for this, because the primary thing in Vietnam was try to sort of neutralize and force the enemy out of vast underground bunker complexes. And actually, you know, the use of CS gas had successes in that, also had failures. It, you know, it, it's, it was by no means the miracle a you know, weapon to clear out a Viet Cong bunker complex. Uh, it didn't work that well for that. You know, in some cases, there were a lot of basic countermeasures that the Viet Cong could do. Also, there was the physics of actually getting the, the smoke cloud where, where it needed to go, because uh, some of these things literally drag on for miles. So tear gas is not actually the panacea for dealing with an underground bunker, you know, but it was used rather prolifically, Okay. And again, used back on to, in, and again, in numerous instances, used back on the Americans because uh, in the scope of this conflict, stuff gets captured and, and used back on. So there's a little bit of back and forth on it. It's 98% U.S. versus the, Viet, uh, the North Vietnamese Viet Cong, but 2% the other way. You have some instances of the more traditional munitions, like artillery shells, mortar shells, cluster munitions that you mentioned before. Again, these were designed basically to flush people out of a village or out of a forest complex and things like that. Again, mixed bag. Uh, again, with the villages, it ended up being arson and almost because these things were flammable devices. And so more of the, becomes more of the weapon than the actual uh, tear gas. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, there's a continuum of these things. So you get that. While this is going on, you get a whole new advent of a sort of second wave of marketing of tear gas in the U.S., now marketing largely towards women, so-called mace spray. And this, this again, gets into a little bit of this weird incestuous corporate relationships because the firearms company Smith & Wesson buys one of the one of the tear gas manufacturers uh, and buys it so that they can get more of a revenue stream from women. Then we sort of, you know, we get into the more modern day uh, you know, I mean, people are people are pretty down on, on President Nixon, but you know, those of us in the in the defense against the dark arts, you know, we we really owe him a favor for pushing chemical and biological disarmament. The biological disarmament was pushed a little bit faster than the chemical, but the ball started to roll a bit harder after President Nixon, and eventually that rolling ball, you know, over the course of the seventies and eighties, becomes this thing in the nineties becomes international law which is the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, the Chemical Weapons Convention is a much better document than the old Geneva Protocol. The old Geneva Protocol is a single sheet of paper. It doesn't really define anything. It leaves a lot of gray area. The great thing about the CWC is it defines a lot. Of it. it defines what a riot control tear gas is, defines what a chemical warfare agent is, and it categorically bans tear gas and warfare. But a few pages later, it also categorically carves out an exemption for tear gas use in civilian policing. Okay, so some people think that's a paradox, uh, and I often find myself on, on on social media trying to defend that paradox. I think it's actually not a paradox. I think, first of all, police use as troublesome as it can be. I think it is good. It is good in principle for police to have non-lethal, generally non-lethal means of of force. Okay, now that doesn't mean those should be unregulated. I think there is much need for regulation of tear gas. That's another issue. But science and industry and society should be in the business of steering police away from things that are generally lethal. You know. Uh, I think there's a lot of scenarios where somebody got shot by a policeman, and that situation could have been resolved with not uh, with less lethal force. Okay, so I don't think as a society we should be taking away the non-lethal tools and just leaving law enforcement to have the lethal. Okay, but on the warfare side of things, I think it's extremely useful because if you look at 
how chemical warfare actually works on the battlefield. Um, average soldier doesn't know what he's been hit with. If he's been hit with something that is, it's a it's a vapor cloud, a, an irritating liquid, a gas, something. He just knows that it's miserable and it's causing cash. At the time of use, the average soldier doesn't know if it's tear gas or not. You say, oh, it's just tear gas. Tear gas can be easily mistaken for something else, thus tripping off a upward spiral of tragic and unnecessary escalation. Uh, at the time that this chemical weapons convention was being negotiated, uh, we were looking at a sort of tense tripwire, you know, in places like Korea, that's still there, and Western Europe, where it was widely believed that you, uh, first use of chemical warfare was going to immediately result in uh, escalation into tactical nuclear weapons. So, mistaking a mistaking tear gas for something more serious could be the slippery slope to global annihilation. Okay, it sounds dramatic, but that was the thinking at the time. Yeah, and of course, back before that, during the Second World War, I mean, part of the reason we didn't see tear gas used widely was because there was a hesitancy among Western states to use first, and they assumed there'd be large-scale retaliation. In fact, that hesitancy was not just constraining in terms of their own behavior. They didn't want to do things that would sort of push the push over a line, but even to the extent that they were willing to over ignore certain low-level forms of use if it was deemed to be easier to ignore if, particularly if it was seen as a sort of local tactical use rather than raise the issue and actually risk going down a direction that no state wanted to go to. For example, there was an incident in Yasmo in, uh, in in Poland in the first few weeks of the war where some, early by local initiative, some Polish troops used some diluted mustard agents against the Germans. Uh, the Germans were very good, actually, at defusing and stepping away from that, okay, and tapping that down, particularly if you read General Oxner's memoir. He was the head of the chemical defense troops during the entire war uh but yeah but also from a from a practical standpoint your tear gas agents can easily be mistaken particularly from a 1980s early 1990s technical perspective uh the state of the art of chemical warfare detection in those days was not very specific various chemical warfare agent detectors would give you a false alarm for nerve agents or blister agents in some cases on these things also the actual smell and feel of some of these things resembles other things Okay, so, and I'll give you the sort of the catalog, that old chemical CN, that fruity smell. Well, that fruity smell smells very similar to Taboon. And particularly when, I've never smelled Taboon. The Tell Corporation used to, in the U.S. used to make a very well-defined odor simulate for Taboon, and it smelled like CN, okay? You know, even sort of CBRN specialists, they're reading their charts and tables in the book. CN, fruity smell like apple blossoms. Taboon, fruity smell like apple blossoms. This is not, you know, this is not rocket science, okay? All right. Um, uh, CS uh, smells, feels like the more dangerous chemical chloropicrin, all right? And chloropicrin, widely used in, in agriculture. Also, yeah, not so much now, but at various points in various societies, being used as a fumigation agent. Uh, chloropicrin having a little bit of a look in as a, as a, as a first-generation tear gas agent even using some of those safes we're talking about, abandoned because its safety margin as a tear gas agent is very narrow, okay? But also, atom site. We haven't really talked about atom site. It's a riot control agent. It's not really a tear gas agent. It's a vomiting and sneezing gas. You know, it's, it's smoke. But it will, give a te it will give a positive test of many test methods for lewisite because it's an arsenic cup, okay? So all these things out there could, for a variety of different reasons, be mistaken for something else not to mention the basic idea that you know gee you use some tear gas and you get the enemy they oh, it is a tear gas again you slip something more lethal in the tear gas i mean the great uh, well the interesting thing about tear gas is you know it's got diminishing marginal returns on the same if you if you use it on the same target and prison services have found this out in sort of prisoners barricaded you know 
eventually they just get used to the gas. Okay. You can get used to the effects of CS. All right. I, I did. In fact, you, you realize that you aren't actually choking. It's unpleasant to breathe, but you're still breathing. You're still exchanging oxygen. You learn to tolerate it and you, you know, get a toleration for it. So if this happens to the front line of troops and then somebody mixes in some taboon or sarin with it, guess what? You know, it could be used to screen something more nasty. And I guess there's a secondary argument in that getting the munition manufacturers of the world out of the making making, uh, making chemical warfare munitions that are big enough for military systems like mortars and, and you know, artillery shells and things like that. I, I actually don't buy that argument because actually munitions industry is still making smoke rounds. And the way you make a smoke round is far more like how you disseminate tear gas than how you, than how you disseminate, say, sarin or mustard. So I, I'm not sure I'd buy that argument, but it's an argument that is articulated. Then we get into sort of the modern day. And funny roundabout way, we get to why I really sort of, you know, summon you up to say, can I get on your podcast? Because we're seeing this, we're seeing these issues play out in real time in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Because what we have right now is we have relatively low-level use uh, uh, Russian tear gas grenades, mostly delivered by drone. And we're getting these devices misrepresented in social media, even in press conferences, as as things that are more serious than they are. And it, it sort of it comes in two forms. First of all, the classic, you know, years ago when I said, yeah, a CS, uh, well, it can be mistaken for chloropicrin. It's being mistaken for chloropicrin practically every third day on Twitter. Uh, this K-51 tear gas grenade, which has been in the Soviet arsenal, was developed by the Soviets in at least the mid-'80s. Uh, there's a great Dutch journalist, Hans de Vrij, who's got a picture of one from the late-'80s, uh, photographic proof that this is not a new thing. This is not a newfangled thing. Second, I managed to take one apart in South Africa in 2003. Uh, it was glorious. Uh, so I, I, I've been on the inside of one of these things, you know. You can't put chloropicrin. Chloropicrin's a liquid. CN and CS are solids. And in this case, it's a CS grenade. And, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's got a burning filler, you know, and it's a high temperature plastic uh, that is, is it'll darken but won't meld at the temperature the thing burns at. But guess what? <laughs> the chloropicrin will very much leak out, erode, and degrade. And it's not a chloropicrin. Grenade. Somebody has mistaken the physical characteristics, the, 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 the signs and symptoms of chloropicrin and, and odor with CS. And this other, there's another grenade. This other, this other grenade, which uh, has a the RG60, is almost certainly a CN grenade. And then you get these ridiculous claims about CN. CN you know, can kill you in five minutes. Or five people have died already from CN. Um, that, 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 this is, this is um, a classic... Uh, example of malinformation. Uh, the five people who died from CN died in the 30s and 40s. Okay, uh, uh, this 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 five people who died from CN is that a, a study in the late 1980s of the entire global history of CN uh, from sort of 1920 to the present day could identify five people that actually died of CN from toxicity as opposed to uh, the other things, you know, burns, uh, you know, suffocation, you know. Blunt force trauma. So five people in 60 years, 60 something years globally died. And, and, and that fact has been sort of repurposed as some Yes, five people have already died, but you know, if you're by definition of already is actually since 1920 around the world. Okay, so that's a it's a misrepresentation. And so we're seeing this play out as a misinformation, disinformation thing. Is it like the French policeman? Is this basically I mean, the, the the original use of these things, the hypothesis is that these were, these guys were policemen who were called up in the in, in in the occupied areas. These were you know those puppet regimes there. These were the local cops there who then got basically into into soldiers and used their tear gas as a local thing, which of course has uh, parallels with the, the French story. And of course, if we look to the first days of invasion, one of the ill-fated units, as I recall, that ended up trying to go to Kiev before Kiev fell he never did there was lots of images at the time circulating of their riot control kit including the masks and the, we assume the, the tear gas they would have had as yeah. part of riot control 
and so that link there makes makes sense yeah yeah i can see how this happens uh but the the perpetual cycle of misinformation and disinformation just you know proves why this ban of use in wartime is a good thing and why that deserves it deservedly is in the uh is in the cwc i think it's a classic example of uh, of why that ban is there and it's it's why guys like you and i need to sort of throw the yellow and red cars on this stuff when we see it because it does it does nobody any good to go down this road but more importantly i think it doesn't do the ukrainian cause any good to uh inadvertently or deliberately exaggerate something that is largely non-lethal into something that is lethal from a ukrainian defensive standpoint that is doing the enemy's work for him and these well-meaning people who are running around saying chloropicking grenades are not doing the ukrainian cause any good they're, they're either deliberately or most likely most of them probably inadvertently doing moscow's propaganda job and this is my note to all you guys out there cut it out there we go of course i mean we had um elliot higgins on on last the last special and, and part of the thing we got into there is the problem in this area and of course and we talked about the technical aspects of of right control agents but of course politically and socially um and particularly when we get to things like conflict situations because we've had the history of routes of escalation and the need to draw lines and the the issue of course is that a non-lethal chemical weapon agent or less lethal chemical weapon agent which in of itself does not present necessarily more of a human rights risk to the soldiers on the battlefield than conventional missions doesn't seem to be something merit discussion but because it's tied to the long history of prohibition of the chemical weapon category and that survival of that prohibition is entirely reliant on the idea of a general prohibition at least whether it should be how that's emerged is complicated but essentially if you start allowing agents to be used on the battlefield but in this way you do a huge damage to the coherence the broader norm and the prohibition of lethal and other types of agents exactly the entire category of tear gas riot control agents is problematic. It's the sort of thing where if CS was invented today, I don't think you could get away with using it. I mean, it's, um, you know, we take it on faith that somehow some good toxicology has been done on this stuff, and actually it hasn't, okay? You look back at the original studies on this stuff, it's kind of grandfathered in. You couldn't ever get this stuff approved in a civilized society now. And the general trend in, in warfare is that yeah, things that are designed to cause needless pain and suffering aren't really, really wanted as weapons. But needless pain and suffering is exactly the point of a tear gas. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental paradox juxtaposition, and it has gained a veneer of uh, historical credibility. You know, but that yeah, you can you can see why I'm gradually writing the world's slowest book on this. It keeps getting delayed, but you know, there's a lot of issues here. It's a really messy one because even at different levels, so you have the technical toxicological side and discussions about these agents and mm-hmm. use in reality, use in lab conditions, yeah. danger, uh, risks, long-term risks, health consequences. And that itself is a area of significant discussion, debate. You could, yeah. The next level, you then have questions about how and the extent to which these things belong on the battlefield, whether or not. Yeah, it's just by habit that we don't have them in normalized in war for that they have their utilities and those sorts of things. Then above that, you have the political and social, like how this relates to broader state identities, sense of laws of war, uh, the functioning of other prohibition regimes, and then uh, I guess at the more kind of surface level, you also have the kind of public imaginations and the kind of image of these weapons, yeah. which also the fact that you know. Uh, whenever we see riot control, which may involve often human rights violations, but very often tear gas is characterized often you see it as, as a chemical weapon. You see same thing as white phosphorus talked about. Yeah. And in that context, the reason that language has been used, of course, is to describe it in a way that makes it sound terrible. And so that at those various levels, there's always stuff going on whenever we talk about tear gas and Yeah, there's there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack and actually uh, I, I can let me give a plug to my sponsor because I'm, uh, you know, I'm actually, I, I yeah, I, I, yeah, for once I have a sponsor. I'm, I, I'm speaking to you from the uh, premises of Gladstone's Library in North Wales, 
uh, where I am actually giving a talk tonight on the chemical warfare taboo and uh, why does it exist and does it should it exist? And uh, of course, I'm I'm very very much anti chemical weapons. My my audience tonight, God bless them, they come to hear me, but I'm using them as a little bit of a you know, focus group uh, about chemical weapons. I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up the issue of tear gas. So, to finish, I guess I'll ask, uh, we'll focus a little bit on on the allegations in Ukraine. And from your perspective, what do you think useful things that either open source investigators or people with a broader interest in things like the chemical weapons prohibition, what type of work could they helpfully be doing at the moment, do you think, in relation to this issue? Okay. First first of all, I'd say munitions identification is a real thing, okay, from an open source thing. Uh, Don't just leap on to the idea that, oh my God, you know, it's chloropicrin because somebody said chloropicrin. There's real munitions reference material out there. And the stuff that's out there by people like, I'm going to give a shout out to Cat UXO. Uh, there's, an, there's another outfit. And there's another outfit. They're a bit francophone, EOD 205. They're putting out actually really good information and very technically accurate information. So don't bugger up the munition identification, okay? There is a growing body of knowledge and methodology on this. And, you know, it's there for you to find. And guys like Elliot Higgins put an awful lot of free resources out there to help you do it. Okay. So I'd say stick to the existing methodologies because they've been good in the past in other conflicts. And we shouldn't just throw that out the window here. There's been very good methodology developed about exactly identifying munitions in other conflicts. We're doing it for years in Yemen and Syria, Ethiopia, places like that. Okay. Uh, don't drop the ball just because it's happening in the air. Uh, second, I'd also say, you yeah, know, not just this munition identification. I mean, there are specialists out there. Honest to God, I mean, I'm here. I'm I'm the most easily approachable guy in the entire world on this subject. Come find me. I'll, I'll, I'll and I will render an opinion for you, and I will do it for free, because there is a there is an information warfare aspect to this. You know, running around with a half formed conclusion or a, a fully baked conclusion that is uh, wrong because you you based it on sort of the wrong thing, not helpful to anybody. I'd also say, you know, from the Ukrainian standpoint, there is there are official mechanisms, okay? I know the Ukrainian government has got labs to analyze this, okay? And I know that they have they can do chain of custody, collect samples and all that. And some of this stuff we see basically is freelancing from people further down in the chain of command, jumping the official processes, wanting to get noticed. Some, I'm not going to name any names because most of this is actually done in good faith because they think they're out. Some of this is being put out by basically foreign volunteers who are out there alongside the Ukrainian military. It's like, oh my God, this is happening. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Um, put away your Ernest Hemingway hat for a bit and put on your Elliot Higgins hat for a bit. Okay, is what I say to those people. Uh, you know, just be careful with what you say because there there are official processes. Uh, Ukraine can go to the OPCW. It hasn't, and that's revelatory, okay? Because I think at the national level, I think Ukraine is doing the right thing. It's not making a big deal about these things, okay? It's doing the right thing. It's fielding PPE to its soldiers, fielding training to its soldiers, you know, collecting samples where it can and trying not to make a big deal about it. Yes, tear gas is a war crime, used in war, uh, we also have to be grown up about this in the context of rape, murder, you know, massacres of entire villages, you know, targeting a civilian infrastructure, you know, genocide, kidnapping of kids, et cetera, et cetera. This is a little bit like trying to give a park t- parking ticket to a mass murderer, okay? So we have to, you know, trying to stick all your eggs, oh my God, th- as if this is the one thing that is going to make Putin get punished. No, let's be realistic. And of course, I mean, recent experience in different conflicts. The issue is that uh, it's almost a bit like judo sometimes, in the sense that if you give a focal point for a, for a for an adversary in terms of certain topics, it doesn't do you or the institution you go to any favors in some respects. And so it has to really be worth it and considered. I know that this issue has been raised uh, uh, quietly, uh, publicly by a couple of uh, status parties to the OPCW, but I certainly don't get the sense that there's much hunger. Uh, to pursue this at the moment um and yeah so i mean of course there's lots of discussions to have about that and thresholds of response and how violation is dealt with and whether certain types of violation 
do challenge the norm where they don't and and people will disagree about that sort of subsequent sort of house from home but dan i know that you need to go off and do some writing and preparing for your talk this evening thank you so much for coming on the show it's been wonderful to chat to you i've got lots of things to think about there well thank you and uh, it's uh it's good to get to get out to sort of talk about tear gas again you know i've been stuck on some other things and uh, you know i it, i really appreciate these this this soapbox you've given me here you are most welcome and i look forward to getting you back on the show very soon <laughs>